So I was 14, it was my first visit to Paris, and we went to one of the Paris revival houses, and I didn't know anything about it, and I knew who Buster Keaton was, but I, I couldn't remember, if it was, I'd seen some si early silent films, some Chaplin, but it was, it was just such a, a, a magical thing, in, you know, <laughs> s partly seeing it in Paris, but also that I had no idea what a great artist he was, and, and how, you know, charming and funny, but what a great kind of, you know, piece of film it was. And, and I think it's probably not, you know, like you say, it's kind of the first one of his decline. But it's still, looking at it now, and I watched it again before this, um, it still has great things in it, I think, great, as all his films do. Fantastic yeah, no, no, things. what I meant, it wasn't artistic decline, it was like the decline of his artistic freedom, you know, yeah. that because, because really, uh, it was tied, we was since then, for, for many years, it was tied to MGM, and yeah. they wouldn't allow him to work with his own people, mm -hmm. and they kept, he said they kept sending script, you know, had those, these very complicated yeah. plots that he didn't want to uh, go with, with. Yeah. and uh, and that, that slapstick is something that you have a basic idea and then you kind of make it up, you know, how, yeah. how, how, how you're filming. And so the studio was not uh, designed for, for that, in that sense, yeah. I meant, not artistic oh, yeah. decline. No, no, yeah. it was just his freedom. No, and I think, I think it started me off on watching silent movies, which to me are, are like the purest kind of cinema. And there's something so incredible about all these, uh, when, when somebody does things for the first time, and, and uh, cinema... Silent movies are the first time that people do things. And, and, and Buster Keaton did many things for the first time with the camera. You know, like Chaplin's great and his choreography is great, but he didn't do anything radical with the camera. But, Chaplin, uh, but Keaton was a great director. And I can see it more now. Just, just the places he, he placed, nobody was doing that in 1928. You know, there's those shots when it's going through the window that during the, the sinister Chinese Tong Wars, you know, 1920s Hollywood. But, uh, you know, shooting from behind somebody shooting into the street onto, onto Chaplin. You know, it's really so exciting. But there, there's something, nobody will, in terms of these great silent stars that I, I got really interested in, no one will ever be as famous as, as Chaplin and Keaton and, and Mary Pickford were. You know, they had an experience that's so astounding because they were the first, because they were the first, you know, of, of electronic media. And, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, Brad Pitt, anybody now, they'll never be as famous or have the crazy trajectory that, that these stars had. And they, you know, they all came from kind of nothing and became godlike for a few years and then had these, you know, in, in Keaton's case, um, this terrible kind of downfall, you know, sort of destroyed by the studio system, becoming an alcoholic, destroyed, you know, he could have actually had a career in sound, but nobody would let him. So I've also became really fascinated by his, his story as a kind of parable of, the you know, metaphor for the, the great artist in Hollywood. At the same time, when I saw his film when I was 14, I saw that film in a theater because the French and also the Italians, the Europeans had, had rediscovered him. And so he was old and, you know, he luckily lived just long enough. To, to see his, his, his being brought back to uh, fame and, and, yeah. and love, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's both a really um, sort of tragic story and, 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 and has a kind of, kind of beautiful ending in a way. Um, and I, I think that he, you know, this film and all um, Keaton's films, they represent a lot of what's, you know, his story represents like the best and the worst of, of Hollywood because, you know, th these people came from nothing, were suddenly given freedom and, and, and to create an art out of nothing that no one had ever done before. And he created these lasting works of art and it never, for one moment, I think, when he was making them, did he think that, that that's what he was doing. I think he thought he was doing, you know, entertaining people and making something, making people laugh, you know, that he was a, cra a craftsman, which obviously he was a fantastic craftsman. But, you know, in the spirit of trying to entertain people, he made things that are, you know, completely alive today. 
but but I but I think I think that's very true. But I also think, especially watching this film, part of the reason why I picked it for the you know for this for the for this particular series is this sort of meta dimension. So yeah. there is an awareness of, of him as a, a, a filmmaker yeah. and the use of camera. And you know, and the film has these little moments where he sort of he sort of says, "We're making a movie." You yes. know, when he put the knife in the <laughs> hand, <laughs> you know, when he put the hand, in, you know, and then in the in the hand or yeah, um, a classic documentary film. Maker, by the way, yeah. no, that's, well, that's not quite reality. Is not quite good enough. Yeah, yeah, you know, or, or the you know when he when he uh, screws up and and the, he has the uh, he has the, uh, the, the the warship coming down Fifth Avenue and all yes. those things. You know, those are like it's it's like a commentary on film on yes. film language, and he shows how sophisticated. I, I do think it's pretty sophisticated for twenty eight oh. to have that degree of meta language. Oh, I think that he was a really great. I mean, he was a really great director, and he had a really great and kind of kind of almost, also in Sherlock Jr., actually, kind of avant-garde sense of cinema. I, I feel like, you know, especially in things like, not so much in this one, but maybe Sherlock Jr. and other ones, um, Bunuel, I'm sure, saw, well, you know, was affected, saw him. I mean, obviously, there's lots of people now, like Wes Anderson and everybody was affected by him. But yeah, he had um, a very, very sophisticated sense of, of, what's, of what film could do, I think, beyond what a lot of people, at the same time, What's interesting is he, I think he also took pride in not using tricks for his stunts. Like part of the, the magic of, of Keaton is you know it's him jumping on that yeah. moving fire truck. You know, oh, he's not, yeah. you know. But it's, but it's true, I love, I, and, and it's kind of his um, uh, kind of homage, I think, you know, to also that, that he liked the scrappiness and the risk taking of those you know, because that opening shot is of uh, war, war footage, war cameraman. Yeah. And I'm sure he really admired the, um, the daredevil aspect mm -hmm. of the, you know. Yeah. And you can imagine, he would have been a great cameraman. You know, he could have been that, you know, a great cameraman, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, he, he, he was behind uh, the camera most of his most of his films. It, it doesn't get credit, but sometimes he did, sometimes he did. And but he liked Sedgwick because he was an established MGM director of, of comedy, so he he, li he liked him. He just thought that the studio was getting in in the way. But he yeah. didn't seem to care too much about being you know labeled as the director. But he's clearly uh, he, you know most of the films he's 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 designing them and 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 picking the camera. Yeah, you know. because I mean they're not like anybody you know. They're not like anybody else's. He, you know, he he was pushing it forward. Yeah. You, you mentioned in passing um, his influence on, on contemporary cinema. Has it influenced your work, uh, Kitonin, in what ways? Uh, I don't know because I, I I wouldn't dream of trying to do really difficult. I think I think physical comedy is the hardest thing to do, you know. And I would never sort of. I, I'm very in awe of what he does. I'm. Um, there's a deadpan thing I re you know, that I, I really love. There's a certain deadpan comedy that I think I'm inspired by, you know, and that he mixes kind of sad things in comedy. I really like how he does that. But um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't even say I would, would be able to be, because I think what he does is such complex physical action, you know. I, I'm just kind of in awe of it. It's funny, once when I was, for a while I was teaching, I t just a couple times taught directing, and I did always would do a class on physical comedy because I realized that actually lots of students can do like, you know, poetic little artful films, but almost no one can do physical comedy. It is absolutely the hardest thing to do. Um, you know, it involves so much timing and expertise and, and skill, and, and to actually make it funny and, and technically right is extremely difficult. And yet, I think it's it's funny that I think Keaton, that people don't don't rate it, you know, uh, the same way people just don't rate comedy in the in the same level as you know. Well, it's also that it's getting so verbose, you know, yes. and and this the purity of this is is so is so beautiful. Just the, the mm. tiny tiny gesture, you know, when they, mm. when he's near the girl, oh. and they're like profiling, oh. and he's just like <laughs> leaning a little bit, you know. That is just so tiny oh. and so moving. And the other thing I love about him is, um, is his performance is so subtle. And when you see, he's surrounded by um, people who are not at all subtle, you know, or people like the, the cop, you know, the Irish, who, who's kind of overacting and people are mugging. And he's always, it's just 
always completely pure and, and just doing the sort of little facial variations, which are, are, are fantastic. So. Were you a, an avid moviegoer as a teenager? Um, I started going to the... Na I was... In, uh, I moved to London when I was 13, and I started going to the National Film Theatre. Um, and, and I really learned a huge amount from, from you know, and I would go on my own. I don't know why. I just started going to movies on my own. I, I think maybe I just assumed that nobody would want to see them. And, uh, and I, I would go and see silent films. I would, um, seeing films that also really influenced me, films like M, seeing that, uh, Double Indemnity, um, some Hitchcock, and yeah, so I... I I just started seeing films that you couldn't see anywhere else and seeing them in the, in a theater, you know, in, in kind of, in really nice prints. So, yeah, that's what. And then I'll open to the, to the, to the audience. I'm wondering about your relationship with black and white because mm -hmm. color is one of the things that I think when I, th I think of your film, your work is mm -hmm. defined a lot by, uh, mm -hmm. by color and, mm -hmm. and a very coherent design use of, of color. It's funny because I actually love, I mean, Betty Page um, is black and white, but then it has color in it. And I always wanted to mix. Um, and my early stuff when I was directing at the BBC, I started mixing film stocks and um, sometimes using sort of black and white and color. Um, but there, I, I do, I do love. I don't know. There's so, there, there's something that I would always, I always love to see, just very pure, beautiful, silent black and white, like for 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 like a, the complete experience. And, and do you think? And do you think that it seems that Keaton is. And I don't know if that's the right word, but as at, at, at least right more modern, has stayed more modern and, and in a sense more relevant to to contemporary filmmakers. Do you think is that my yeah, impression? Yes, I, th I think uh, I think he is. I mean, he's certainly. I've always, although I, you know, as I've gotten older, I've started to appreciate Chaplin more. Also, Chaplin's more sentimental, I think, um, and. And yeah, Keaton has, is, is pure and more sort of austere. He doesn't go for, you know, obviously there's emotion in it, but he doesn't go for really pulling your heartstrings. I think his sense of humor is very sophisticated. Uh, you can definitely see him. I mean, and I think he's, he's I'm obviously influenced Jackie Chan and all these people who do physical comedy, but I think that he's, I think he influenced Samuel Beckett. I think he influenced, you know, all kinds, you know, any kind of deadpan comedy, <laughs> I think, is we had we had. Uh, I don't know if some of you were were at the screening, but last year we had uh, Bob Wilson uh, pick a film, and he picked a, he picked Keaton, he picked a general, and then referred to him as one of the major influencers of his of his theater. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and um, and Orson Welles thought he was the greatest of them, and of course they also they had similar, you know, they they are they are kind of cr crushed crushed by Hollywood in the end because I think that he. You could you can see in in someone who is obviously so great at improvising. Like one of my favorite things in that is the baseball game that he does, oh, yeah. which is simple. And I think he just decides I'm going to do a baseball game and I'm going to do it all on my own. And it, I don't know because it's not really anything to do with the story. I think he just <laughs> something he wanted to. And it's so fantastic. And you can imagine that he just just got to the field and. Improvised it. Yeah, yeah and, and unlike other uh, great silent stars like Chaplin and, and Lloyd, he never owned his, his, his film. You know, Harold Lloyd owned his films, and you know he was licensed them to mostly Paramount. But then at mm. the end, they, they stayed with him, and so mm. it, Keaton had a much more trouble financial, uh, financially speaking, career. And uh, yeah, and somebody somebody collected his films. I mean, it's just very fortunate they could have half of them could have been lost. But I think yeah, yeah some I think collectors. I think Charles Cohen has a lot of them. And you know, I I, we, I recommend and Mary mentioned it in, in in an interview she gave a couple of weeks ago to the Express. Um, the, uh, the, the the documentary that Bogdanovich did on uh, on on Keaton, which is based on on the uh, on, on the Cohen collection on the uh, on the archive material, which is really great. And Bogdanovich is a great cinephile wrote it so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice uh, you know it's a nice piece uh, to, to to get a complete thing of his career mm. and uh, questions for for Mary there um, what do you think of the sort of meta theatricality of, of him going to locations with the camera and this being one of the first films that was probably shot on location did you think what do you think of that yeah I mean I loved that I, that was also so when I first saw it when I was a kid was was what I was sort of so enchanted by too was actually oh my god I'm in New York you know in in 19 in the 1920s and I think that there's there's that thing that those 
films do. I think Harold Lloyd did a bit of that too, but you know, it, it's just this suddenly, oh, I'm in Brooklyn, or where, where are we at Coney Island? I mean, there, there, there is just the, 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 the sort of documentary element, I think, is really great um, in this film. Um, but also that, it, that, he's, that he's, he's playing with, and then I, I wasn't sure, the Tong War scene, I think that's actually on a set. That's that's on a set because I mean in in his um, autobiography, which yeah. is which is really fun read, is my my great great order slab, slapstick. He says that they, they the first day they went out, they were, they were on Fifth Avenue, and and you know they started shooting, but it was like, hey Buster, and so yeah. they couldn't they couldn't block it I enough, and so they had to do some some of the and the tongue war is definitely uh, is definitely studio and uh, yeah. Because actually yeah, yeah. This, this time seeing it, you can see just the edge of one of the sets. This time. But it's but it's you know they're great sets. I have to say because when I first saw it, I was just like, oh, I'm in New York. You know, I'm in Chinatown. Yeah, I did. yeah that's really. It's, and it was him that wanted to shoot in this, you know in New York. It just had to change yeah. plan. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's. Uh, uh, Is this one of the first films with a star with an animal sidekick? <laughs> Because honestly, I could not believe the way that the monkey was introduced. It was so existential, for one thing. First, it was tragic, and then it was hysterical. And it, it had me as tense as anything else in the film. And yet, the way that it morphs into this whole, you know, talking about meta, this whole other level of something going on with, with him, like, literally having this peculiar sidekick. And... <laughs> I just, it blew my mind. I was not expecting I know, that. I know, what a monkey, and, and then at the end he says, and that's the best camera work I've ever seen, and it's the monkey. You know. um, I don't know where, the, I'd love to know where they've, that monkey's a genius that found the little, um, no, I, I also I love that another, another Filmmaker, another artist would have would have overplayed the whole thing about the death of the monkey. But it's like they cover, you know, it's very dead. Yeah, it covers it the white sheet. It's sad he's carrying this, you know, dead thing around, which is also very modern because it's yeah. kind of dark. You yeah. know, they're just I'm just going to carry this around and to kind of put it somewhere, and then suddenly it's back to life. So that's I think also his very modern sense of humor, too. Yes. Compared to, I mean the big films of, of today, the major sets and the multi-million dollar productions. Um, how long did this take to shoot, do you think? And because every scene is so action packed and, you know, it, there's hardly a scene where there's nothing going on. It's just, it, it's so full. Yeah. Everything is so rich. And also, do you know how much it costs to make this? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't. But I mean, I think, he was he was extremely you know meticulous, and just watching it again this time, I was thinking, how did you get the the time? You know, because you can't. He couldn't have been able to rehearse it that many times, but he had to not only get all the background moving in the right place and the camera at the right speed, but he himself had to run through, jump on the, on the fire truck. The fire truck has to pull into the station, you know, and all that. Just everything at the right moment. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know how long was the shoot or how much it was, but as I said briefly in the, in the iteration, it was just coming out from a, from a big financial disappointment, which was the general, and which was not uh, rejected by the audience, but it was a hugely expensive production, you know, because it was on a train and they had, they blew up a bridge. I mean, it, it, it was, he it, it had, it had been given all this money, and so I presume this was, uh, you know, the studio pulled back a little bit, but he wasn't working. I don't think Keaton was working on the cheap, at least not not here. I mean, there there, there are resources there, and mm -hmm. and even just for you know. And the, the other meta thing I like is you know the parade that was Lindbergh at yes. the end. You know, and he's <laughs> like, hey, and and, yes, and, yes. <laughs> and that's a, that, that's a sort of a way you know. Yeah, we can make filming by using other people's footage. You know, there is all this all this uh, lessons in, the, in. And I don't I don't know if if people have been doing that before, mixing real footage and 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 drama. I don't know. No, no, with this, I, I don't think. With this iron, you know, yeah, with this, not in the yeah, open, not in the, yeah, not in, yeah, so, not in so comedies, not this way. All, all these kind of very, very modern things he was doing, you know. Um, yes, there. I know oh, there. Oh, I'm sorry. Hmm. Uh, another film in the series, I believe, was the Elaine May, A New Leaf. 
That was, that was in the summer, yeah. It was a different series a different of comedy. Yeah. Well, I wonder if anyone knows if she was influenced in the dressing gown scene in that movie by this movie where the men are changing clothes. That's a very good question. Uh, that, that, that's a very good question. I think the deadpan may yeah. would probably. Yes, I just mean, that, you know, the stone face, the deadpan, and yes, obviously that. The, yeah, and, and it was great. It's very stoic, you know. Yeah. You know the, the deadpan. It's like yes, t everything's colla You know, which was his sort of poetry. What he, you know, everything's collapsing around me. You know, buildings fall on me. I slide off things. I get up. You know, and it's that kind of nobi that nobility that he had. Yeah. Oh, you know. Oh, I, it wasn't a question. I was actually just making a point that um, one of the things about Buster Keaton that I've always appreciated is just how he, he looked at the entire frame as if that was the only thing in the universe. And the physics mm -hmm. of it was if it didn't exist in the frame, it didn't exist. And so I think it, it informs a lot of his comedy. Uh, just, it, which, it, he, a lot on, on location here, but especially in the, the gang war, mm -hmm. it's truly like he's almost a cartoon character and that's kind of what animation does. So that's, that's all. Mm -hmm. Pointing out, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very true, and it really points uh, the uh, the the work that the, the great silo uh, filmmakers did on the choreography within yes. the frame. You know, they were also used to edit, 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 and mm -hmm. what he could have could could make happen in that square, almost square. It's yes. really it is so much. And some ways we've lost the um, um, the ability to block actually to choreograph. Um, so now I was just uh, over Christmas we watched Les Enfants du Paradis, which is a wonderful film that I think is also has a bit of, of Keaton in it, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the character of the mime. Um, and there's unbelievable the whole opening scene is a huge thing in Paris, thousand extras, and it's like oh my god how, we don't we don't even know how to do that anymore because even even if people pretend something's one shot it's really not. But in those days yes it's really one shot and you only have a couple of, of chances to do it. One of the things about about Keaton and Chaplin all those guys is that they they grew up in vaudeville or music you know they grew up acro as acrobats that you know Keaton was from a circus basically a sort of traveling family of entertainers. So I think his, um, um, in the same, same way as Jackie Chan is the sort of equivalent of growing up in the, you know, in the, the being trained as a child. So it's kind of so, so in, ingrained in you how to do these things, this kind of physical skills. And very few people have those any, anymore, that's the thing. So it's kind of a unique experience. Hi. Um I'm actually pretty surprised that the general wasn't considered a, a success. I mean, I, I understand that it, it is very expensive, but I know that, yeah, Orson Welles' favorite film is the general or something. But um, I'm I'm wondering, like, whenever I see him do a stunt like the jumping on the side of the the bus, did he ever get hurt doing any of these? Because I mean, it's quite a liability if 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 he gets hurt and can't continue doing a film. W what happens then? I, I'm always amazed by that. Do you guys know? I'm, sh yeah. I'm yeah. sure he yeah, got, he broke, you know. Uh, yeah, he broke his neck. And, and oh, huh. Yeah, it, but in general, they were used to to be banged up quite quite badly. I mean, breaking the neck is very extreme, but but I think that it was it was different. And you know, and Jackie Chan, he would could yeah. could not. You know, it's interesting because she mentioned Jackie Chan. When Jackie Chan went to work in, in came to work in Hollywood. He could not do his stunts because of the insurance rules. They are so much tougher than Hong Kong. You know, they were like, yeah, whatever. And uh, and and here, you know, they were not. And he really didn't like it because they kept stopping and they wanted to use uh, um, extras. You know, but again, he was aging, so he was not as in shape as he was when he was working uh, in Hong Kong. And so he, you know, it it, it took to it. Uh, yeah. The thing about about Keaton was when he was a child. You know, or even a, almost like a you know toddler. He his dad would you know throw him into the audience. That was part of the family routine. You know, so literally pick him up. They had a thing like suitcase handles sewn into the his jacket. You would pick him up and hurl him, and he was called the boy who can't be hurt. So I think you know he <laughs> that was his that was him as a small child. You know, <laughs> so I was called Buster. You know, oh, is that true? I didn't realize. It. Yeah. Up there. <laughs> mm. 
This is my first Buster Keaton movie. Oh. And um, kind of picking up where this gentleman talked about it as far as getting hurt, I think back then people just took responsibility for themselves. And if he got hurt and he tried to sue somebody, the judge would say, you wanted to do it, you fix it, you take care of it. It's a whole different time we're living in. Um, this man was uh, brilliant. Uh, he was brilliant with his creativity and he was brilliant with his simplicity. It's just, like I said, it's my first Buster Keaton movie. You're in for a treat. In yeah. for a treat. Yeah, in for a treat. There's so <laughs> one of my favorite ones actually is is it is it called Our Hospitality? Yes. There's one set in the South during a feud and um, <laughs> and he wanders into a feud that he's on the wrong side of and they won't they can't kill him as long as he's in their house. But if he goes outside they will and it's it's one of the <laughs> One of the best films I've ever seen. So another thing that I didn't remember oh, of this one, and uh, uh, and I noticed when I watched it that day, and, and then again is the sexual the sexual element, which was is pretty, you know, when he's naked in the pool and all the girls <laughs> go by. I mean, there is there is a, you know, it's pretty interesting. And the the girl was very good as well. I thought yeah. actually Marceline D. Yeah, yeah Marceline yeah. Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's first. This was not the film he wanted to make with 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 MGM. This was like a, a second a second solution. And he wanted to make a western with a famous comedian, uh, Mary Dreary, that was in, in MGM. But she, they, they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow him. They didn't like the western idea. So this, the MGM notion came out of trying to uh, do a little publicity for MGM itself and for Hearst, who owned MGM Newsreel. So it was, it was like a, you know, it's like a plus product placement kind of kind of idea. Yeah, but he made the best out of it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is my first Buster Keaton film too. Mm -hmm. um, it's not. I don't have a question. It's that I want to honor this man and his mm -hmm. work. I think he's a total genius. I just watched um, Charlie Chaplin's um, City Lights a few nights mm -hmm. ago, and um, having seen that numerous times, I guess in my youth, um, this man. <coughs> Is so, well, it's stupid to compare them. To, uh, but there's a scene in this film that is burned on my brain forever. It's when he's hiding out upstairs with the monkey and the camera, <laughs> and the, the guy behind the bookcase closes the shade, <laughs> and there is an Avedon portrait of oh. him there, and the camera stayed on him. Mm -hmm. Remember, it was dark behind him, and just his mm -hmm. three-quarter profile. It was so beautiful. He's a beautiful-looking man. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. This was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, then I want to thank, thank Mary. Thank you all for coming to the screening.